Well, good morning, church. Sorry for the delay. We've had a little bit of a technical difficulty going on. And so later on in the service, when you think I'm preaching long, just keep in mind, we started late. So just bear with us. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Uh, I hope that uh, you took the opportunity through these few extra minutes to, to prepare your hearts. And, and I hope the anticipation has risen to, uh, to stand. Well, you don't have to stand, but we're standing and uh, joining us together in singing praise to our great God. And so I invite you to sing with us as we sing Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name
pray together. Lord God, it's so good to be together, even if it's virtually, to worship you, to sing your praise, for you are so worthy of it. Lord, we're so grateful for who you are, for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will see to completion. God, we are humbled by your great love and mercy and grace that you pour out upon each one of us. So, Lord, we respond and the only way that we truly can that is worthy of such a love, such grace that we've received, and that's to worship you, to sing your praise, to bow down before you, to say, Lord, you are our everything, and we thank you for who you are, and we give you our worship, we give you our praise, we give you our lives as an act of worship before you. We thank you for this time together that we could sing and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Good to be with you on this abnormally cold weekend that we've had here in May. But we know that we're nice and warm and cozy inside our homes together as we watch, but also as we serve and worship our Lord together. Our catechism question and answer for this morning comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. Reading question number 28, which asks us this. How does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? It's a great, great question for us all. And if you would, please recite with me the answer together. We can be patient when things go against us and be thankful when things go well. And for the future, we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing will separate us from his love. All creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. It's a great, great truth for us to hear and share this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wonderful hand that has created for us so long ago and that continues to provide for us today. Thank you, Father, for being who you are and continuing to be in that relationship with us. Father, we thank you that because of who you are, we can have confidence in you. Not confidence in ourselves, not confidence in the things of this world, but our confidence that can be based solely on you. That we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So thank you, Father, for being who you are and who we are because of that. Lord, I ask you to come and be with us through your Holy Spirit this morning. Send it upon each one of us and Pastor Dan as he opens up your word for us this morning. Thank you for, again, being in a relationship with us even so much that you will come and be with us each day that we worship you. Open our ears and our hearts and our souls to your word this morning so that that relationship and your word can change us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. 
We are in our fourth week of this sermon series called Gospel-Shaped Living. And today's sermon is titled, A Generous Church in a Stingy World. Let me read to you from the opening paragraph of our curriculum that we're going through in our small groups for this particular chapter. It says, the great reformer Martin Luther once said that the last place a man is changed by the gospel is in his wallet. 500 years later, that is still true. <clears throat> Our bank statements show much about how deeply we have grasped the gospel. Wonderfully, what we do with our money can also have a great impact for the gospel. So how does and how should the gospel shape your finances. Today we're going to talk about giving, but please don't press the mute button on your TVs or computer screens. What you are about to hear may surprise you, maybe even shock you. <clears throat> I've been so excited to talk about this topic from the pulpit this morning. Giving and money are often viewed as the dreaded topics of discussion on Sunday mornings, both from the hearer, all of you, but also from the one who has to deliver such a message. But I'm excited this morning because there is great reason for us to rejoice. Though it's true that never before have we faced a challenge like what we are facing today as a church. I know some of you may be Go back a lot far enough that uh, you remember when we did not meet into the, in this sanctuary for about two years, I think it was. This actually precedes my time being here, but the roof was caving in in our sanctuary, and so we were removed from this building for a prolonged period of time. But the difference between then and now is that we were still able to meet in person together for corporate worship. We just met outside of this building. But with this quarantine, we have been not only out of this building, but away from each other personally, physically, for eight weeks and counting. But God has been amazingly faithful during this time of trial. And God's people have been amazingly generous as we have faced these uncertain economic times together. If there was ever a time to give in to fear in this area of faithful giving and stewardship, now would have been that time. But we as a church have not done so. The leadership, our consistory of this church, have explored many options over these past weeks and months, and we've made potential plans in case of a financial crisis taking place here in our church. But to the glory of God, we have not had to go beyond the planning stage because God has been so good. And all of you have been so diligent in meeting the financial needs of our church. In both the month of March and April, our giving has exceeded our budget. Let me say that again in case you didn't hear that correctly. In the months of March and April, in the midst of this economic crisis in our world, our giving, your giving, has exceeded the budget of our church this year. From January 1 through April 30th, our giving has increased by $10,000 over last year during the same time period. And yes, I know last year we missed a Sunday in January due to that crazy snowstorm. You remember that? <clears throat> yes, we missed a Sunday. But consider, this is the eighth Sunday this year that we have not met in this building. And yet, giving has been $10,000 over 
what last year's was. All I can do is stand in awe and say, praise God and thank you. Thank you to Him for His faithfulness, but thank you to you as well for your generosity and faithful giving. I know it's not easy. I know the sacrifice is real. My wife has been unemployed for six weeks, and so I know the struggle. But we have not gone without our needs being met, personally as as myself and my family, but also as a church together. And because of this, because of God's goodness and faithfulness, I have been so looking forward to preaching this message. This message was planned out months ago. And any time we get to a place where we're going to talk about giving, I get a little nervous because I know how sometimes people perceive a pastor getting up front talking about money or a church proclaiming a message on stewardship. And then this economic crisis has happened because of this pandemic. And I thought, oh, maybe I need to postpone this message. Or maybe I should should not preach it because I don't want to come across as, as, as trying to put any guilt on people to give more because we need it. But when I started to see the numbers week after week after week, I just stood in awe of God and said, God, you are so good. And my fear to be able to bring this topic before our congregation was alleviated. Not because necessarily I I can't speak on a topic when we are in a troubling economic time, but because God has just blessed us. And I'm so happy to stand before you this morning and share this good news. And so when I thought about preaching this message, but also the songs that we've sung together this morning, I was so anxious, so excited to get here and to sing and praise our great God together with these songs. I had to wait a little longer than I thought. I thought we were going to go right into it this morning. We had some technical difficulties that made me have to wait a little longer, but you know, patience is a virtue, you know, it's fruit of the Spirit, so I'm learning that too. But let me share once again some of these songs, a few lines from these songs that we've just sung together as a church. Blessed be your name. In the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow, Lord, blessed be your name. We are going to praise him in our times of abundance because he is the one who deserves the glory. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. I know we're not past this whole pandemic, and I don't know what tomorrow holds, what next week holds, what next month holds. I don't know if the giving is going to continue in the way it has. We may find ourselves in a desert place, but my hope would be is that we still would come and bless the name of our Lord because we know He is good, He is faithful, and He will provide for us. This isn't a verse from that song, but it could be. Blessed be your name when you provide abundantly in the desert place and lead to our cup overflowing. Think about that. It's not just God providing when it's in abundance and then trusting God to provide even in the desert. Sometimes it's in the desert places that He provides His abundance. Glory be to God. And the song amazed. Lord, we lift You high. O God, be magnified. You have overwhelmed my heart. And I am amazed by who you are amazed at his grace that is sufficient amazed that his mercies are new every day amazed that his provisions have met our every need we stand amazed of what our god has been doing 
We sang the song, Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense so I can face my giants with confidence. He has strengthened our faith. He has restored our hope. He has overwhelmed our hearts so we can continue to step out in faith and face the giants that are before us every single day. And to do so with confidence. Not in who we are or in our circumstances or in the circumstances around us, but confidence in our God. How can we not sing, let all things their Creator bless and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 And guess what? There's still more to sing. I can't wait till after this sermon is done for us to continue to give great praise to our God. I only wish I could hear all our voices singing together. But again, I wait patiently for when that day does come and together we will be in one another's presence in the presence of God singing His praise. But I'm grateful we can do it virtually. I know we've all heard it said that these are unprecedented times. But in terms of the church rising up and responding in faith and with great generosity, it's not. The church has responded this way before. The Scriptures tell us what such a faithful church looks like. We find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1-7. through So let me read it to you now and then share the similarities of what I've seen in you over these past several weeks. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, And in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the words of our God, these words, this story, this testimony, it abides, it lasts, it endures forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul views financial stability here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 as a grace from God. And he is right to say so. Everything we have individually and collectively as a church is a gracious gift from God. Our provisions come from Him. Therefore, He deserves the glory. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, apart from me, if you want to bear fruit, fruit that lasts, fruit that is significant, fruit that will not wither away, fruit that is eternal, He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So even our ability to provide for ourselves Our jobs, our abilities, our skills, our education, our experiences, all of this is still a grace from God. 
For apart from Him, we can do nothing. The Heidelberg Catechism question that we recited together this morning, question number 28, has within its answer, all creatures are so completely in His hand that without His will, they can neither move nor be moved. Do we believe what we've declared together this morning? That apart from His will, we are so securely placed into His hand that we can never be moved. But also, we can never move on our own. It's by the grace of God. What we have, who we are, are objects of God's grace. Our stability, therefore, financially, spiritually, physically, emotionally, comes from being held securely in the hand of God. It is in realizing this that we too can respond as the Macedonian churches did. Look at verse 2. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. What a strange verse. What a strange dynamic this is. That severe affliction led to abundant joy. And extreme poverty led to a wealth of generosity. Only with God is this possible. During affliction, our natural response is to to take what is ours or to take whatever we can get and then to go run and hide and hold on to it as much as we can. When we are the ones needy, it's not usually then that we are the most generous. But God makes this possible in us by His grace. Is our joy abundant right now? In this very moment, in the midst of whatever it is that you are going through, whatever I am going through, is our joy abundant right now? If not, what's our joy based upon? We see such a great example of these Macedonian Christians that in a severe test of affliction, a time of great struggle and need, they had an abundance of joy. And where do you think that joy came from? Their God. What about the wealth of our generosity at a time like this? Is it abundant? For many of you, you have been proving this to be true these last several weeks, just like the Macedonian Christians did in their day. Verse 3, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. What an amazing testimony. That in this difficult time, they gave what they could and more. And they did so freely, Paul says. No one coerced them to give or laid guilt upon them if they didn't. They simply gave because they wanted to. Because they wanted to share in the joy of providing for the needs of others and being a part of seeing the the kingdom of God expanded in this world. In unsettling times like these, does our desire to give increase or decrease? And however you answer that question, Follow it up with the next question of why. Why does it do so? Why does your giving or your desire to give increase during difficult times? 
Or why does it decrease? What is driving your response and how you give? I encourage you to reflect on that today and this week. And then look again to these Macedonian Christians, these Macedonian churches, as their giving increased. And it did so because Paul states that they were, they were begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. We see that in verse 4. They saw the need and the opportunity to give as God's favor. They saw it as a favor from God. God was showing them favor by giving them the opportunity, the privilege to aid in the relief of the saints. Again, they saw the opportunity to give as a grace from God. God's people here in 2 Corinthians 8 begged for the privilege of helping those in need who had been affected by the circumstances of their day. I have too had the privilege to give in such circumstances, but I've also been privileged to see some of this abundant generosity taking place here at Brunswick Reformed Church these past few weeks. People calling me and coming up here and saying, how can I bless someone in this time of need? Who is it that needs relief? Who of my brothers and sisters, a part of this church, can I bless during this difficult time? And I have received multiple gift cards to give out to anyone who is in need. I've received cards with, with gifts inside to, to be anonymously given to certain families and individuals simply because they wanted to bless others during these difficult economic times. I too have been the recipient of blessings from some of you. And what an amazing picture of what we are talking about in this sermon today. The grace of God. Sometimes we just look at the grace of God as what we are receiving when we don't say we deserve it. We define grace as unmerited favor, and so we've received grace unmeritedly. We didn't earn it. But here Paul is seeing that, saying that giving Providing for the needs of others is a grace that He has given to us to engage in. What a different way of looking at it. And so just as Paul witnessed this abundant generosity from the Macedonian churches, and as I have been able to witness the abundant generosity of all of you, Paul says in verse 5, and this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. For Paul, this kind of generosity was surprising, shocking even. It wasn't expected. He, he, he thought there's no way that they could give generously because of their circumstances. He expected the giving that was received would have been less because of what afflictions they were facing. So it was unexpected to see how they responded. But it's the evidence that God was at work as the people of God submitted themselves to Him. First to God, and then they gave themselves to their brothers and sisters in Christ in need. And I've been able to see that our offerings these past two months are the evidence that God is working through us as well. And that God, in the midst of these difficult times, He is providing for our needs through the people that He has brought to be a part of this church. 
And I'm so grateful. And I stand in awe of Him and in gratitude to you. Well, Paul concludes with these words to the Corinthian church in which he is writing in this letter. Verse 7, But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, in your, our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. He says to these Corinthian Christians, keep growing. Keep excelling in all of these aspects of the faith. Keep growing in this area of knowledge. Keep growing in this area of your speech, how you respond to the circumstances you're in. How are you honoring God with what you say, with what you do? But also keep growing in this area of financial giving and stewardship. Be like the Macedonian Christians who set for us a great example. My prayer for us as a church is that we will continue to rise up and excel during this time as well. In each of these ways that Paul calls the church in Corinth to excel in. That we too would grow in our faith during these difficult times. That we too would think about what comes out of our mouths or what is typed on our computer or put on social media that reflects how we are understanding these times and how we are responding to one another in the midst of them. My prayer is that our knowledge of God would grow. That we would see God for who He truly is. The One who is a great provider. The One who created all things, but also sustains all things. The God who watches over us in such a way that not a hair can fall from our head, apart from the will of God the Father. And that we too would see the opportunity to continue to give and to bless others as a grace of God given to us, not just to the recipient, but to the giver. That would be a true picture of what the very grace of God looks like at work. That as we have received abundantly from Him, that we will give and bless others abundantly as well. So let us continue to be a generous church, a generous people, In a stingy world and at a time where people want to hold on to what they have instead of give it away for the blessing of another. For if we live that way, if we follow the example of these Macedonian Christians, we will be light in the darkness and bring hope in the midst of this momentary trial. And that's what it is. God will be faithful. We can trust Him. He has shown Himself to be time and time and time again. And so in gratitude, let's give Him thanks. And let's continue to be the people He calls us to be. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You so much for Your goodness, for Your grace of providing for our needs. But we also see from our passage this morning Your goodness in giving us the grace of being able to be a part of providing for the needs of others. Lord, we thank You that we could be in the situation that we are right now and we give You thanks. And I can stand here and encourage the church in which I'm a part of to continue to set a good example in this way. But Lord, we know there's other churches that are really struggling right now that their giving and their numbers are not what ours are. And so we we pray for them. And we ask that, Lord, how can we be a blessing in the midst of these difficult times in similar ways to the ways in which you have blessed us? So, Lord, continue to lead us and guide us to be the people you call us to be, to live a life 
that reflects the life of Jesus and shines light brightly into a world of darkness. Continue to help us be a generous people by the grace of God. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning again, church. And let me repeat the words of that wonderful video which said, Happy Mother's Day to all. We have a, a gift for all women, whether you're a mother or not, here from our church and 18 years or older. So after church today from 1130 to 1, we have gifts up here at the church that all you have to do is drive up. Don't even have to get out of your car to receive your Mother's Day gifts. We'd love to see you and once again love to celebrate all women on this day. Uh, thank you again for watching with us this Sunday morning. And if you would, please put your name in the comments or send an email to Michelle uh, to let us know that you were here. Uh, th this replaces our uh, welcome cards that we have every week. So if you could, please do that. We would appreciate it. Uh, prayer time will be moved back to Wednesday again this week. And thank you to everyone who joined us on the National Day of Prayer. We had a great time, a lot of participation. Uh, and we hope to continue uh, to do this until we are able to meet together again uh, so Wednesday night this week from 6.30 to 7, if you have any questions, you can ask myself or Pastor Dan, but we'd love to have you join our prayer time this week. And next week, uh, we want to make sure that we are celebrating our graduates from both high school and college. We hope you can join us for worship as we celebrate with them virtually, uh, and I think we're going to have a couple of fun surprises for each and every one of us this year so we can do things differently, but let's be honest, this senior class has been doing things differently for a while now, so they're used to it already. This would be the time in which we continue to worship God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And if you have any questions about how you can continue to give during this pandemic, just feel free to ask. Some prayer concerns for us this week. We want to continue to keep all of our members, friends, and family members in our prayers. Uh, those who are keeping us safe on the front lines against COVID-19. Also those that have been uh, diagnosed with it. Looks like some friends and family members have. Uh, and also those who have lost their employment to do to this terrible disease. We're keeping every one of these groups of people in our prayers, hopefully, as we continue. Uh, and as we continue to see the government lift some regulations, we're praying that we may be getting back to whatever normal will be here in the near future. Uh, we have a praise report. A couple weeks ago, we were praying for Char Cheney's friend, Tricia, who was battling COVID-19. And praise report, she was released from the hospital and is doing better at home right now. Uh, but then we, this week we received uh, a prayer request from my dad, Phil Carroll, asking for prayers for Terry Hager. Terry was a member of Blackberry Ridge, and she was diagnosed with lymphoma this week. So if we could keep Terry and her family in our prayers, that would be great. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each person in this church that has been so faithful in their generosity through this crazy time. Lord, we are blessed as a congregation to not have to make difficult decisions about what we're going to do as a church. We get to celebrate the faithfulness of each and every person that gives to BRC on a regular basis. Father, in our meetings with other pastors, we're even noticing how the, the deficits can be small, but as they compound over time. But our church is not that way. You have provided through the people that love this church. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to them and their faithfulness to us. Help us, Father, to continue to be a generous people as we continue to be a generous church and to give away at least 10% of our budget each year to other ministries that help support your kingdom. Father, be with those at this time who are, are struggling. There are probably so many that we don't even know who have this disease or know someone who has this disease, and, and we lift them up to you, Father, at this time. We lift up all the nurses and doctors and ER workers who are helping to treat patients and putting themselves at risk. And Father, we lift up each and every person that's lost either just a bit of their income or all of their income due to this crazy time. We thank you for your faithfulness and your providence in the midst of everything that's been going on but be with those who are struggling right now. Lord, we thank you and praise you for Tricia and for her update that she has recovered from this disease. And we do thank you, Father, for the high recovery rates uh, from those who have had it but have been able to be recovered. So, Lord, we continue to lift her up in, in her recovery, 
But be with uh, all those right now, Father, who are struggling with this disease again. And Lord, please be with Terry, who is going to start a new journey at this time. Be with her doctors and oncologists and nurses and her family as they struggle through this difficult disease of cancer, which is made even worse in this crazy time. So Lord, be with Terry and her whole family and help us to come around her, those of us who know her very well. Lord, we lift up to you all those in our community who don't know you. Father, we don't know what's keeping them separated from your love, but we pray that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus that reach out to them, to be there for them, that they may see our generous spirit and wonder why we are this way. And Lord, we also pray for uh, these tithes and offerings that have been given, that you use them, Father, not us. You use them for your generous spirit to be given to those who truly need it. We thank you and praise you for each and every person this wonderful day in Jesus' name. Amen.
think about God's great provisions, I can't think of that without thinking about how he has provided for me in my life through my mother. And so on this Mother's Day, as we wrap up this time of worship, this service, I just want to say thank you to my mom, but I also want to encourage all of you to see that God provides for us in abundance of ways. And for you, if you have a mother that is been that grace of God in your life. Celebrate her today. Give her thanks. Or if you have a grandmother or a stepmother or a a woman in in a church, a Christian mother, show your gratitude. Celebrate them on this day. That is really to be an encouragement and to say thank you, but to recognize them as a gift of God, a grace of God in your life. And so happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. And for all the ladies uh, in our church, please come up and, and, and stop by the church between 1130 and 1 today. Uh, I have a gift. We have a gift for you uh, just to, to celebrate you today. So I hope to see you uh, in the next few minutes at some point. Um, but as we go forth into our day today and as we celebrate God's goodness and we celebrate moms, let's keep in mind again how God is that great pr- provider. And let's give him all the glory that he deserves because he is so good. Let us go now by singing the benediction as we depart from this place. Let's, let's sing together. Mm-hmm.